How do we force change in South Africa? At the ballot box or on the streets or both? Welcome to The Big Debate. I'm Ridi Khabi. Boycotts and barricades, burning tires, university occupations, service delivery protests and shutdowns. In South Africa, we are experts when it comes to protest and pressure to force change. For 50 years, we made South Africa ungovernable and we brought down the apartheid regime. Who would have thought, though, that 27 years into democracy, we'd still be in the streets? In 2015, tens of thousands of students in Fees Must Fall forced the government to announce free higher education. In our municipalities, service delivery protests have brought down corrupt administrations. Some communities have used legal action alongside protest, for example, to force the government to replace dangerous pit latrine toilets in schools. Not all protests have been successful, and millions of us are not active citizens beyond elections. Have we placed too much emphasis on voting? Are protests and pressure viable strategies for forcing change in South Africa? With me to discuss this are Busi Siabe, author and former leader of Fees Must Fall. We have Mark Haywood, social justice activist who played a key role in suing the government in the case of Michael Gomape, the five-year-old boy who lost his life in a pit latrine toilet in Limpopo. Akolile Notjuala, Right to Know campaign national coordinator. And of course, Mpo Mujanaka, protest leader from the Mangawung Service Delivery Forum. And of course, in our virtual audience, are active citizens from across the country. Welcome to all of you and welcome to you at home. You can join the conversation using the hashtag on your screen. Let's start with you, Busi. Was fees must fall duped? President Jacob Zuma announced free education but forgot to tell us how we're going to pay for it all. Instead, a couple of months later, his finance minister announced that it would be paid for by increased VAT, VAT, thereby taxing the very same mothers and fathers who couldn't afford to take their children to school. The reality is that the movement almost fizzled, isn't it? It was a historic moment, but it fizzled because it's not reasonable to keep students out in the streets all year long fighting for the same thing over and over again. Thoughts? Definitely. I think what one thing we need to take into cognizance is the fact that former President Jacob Zuma was very disingenuous in his announcement of a free quality decolonized education. And I say this because of the fact that apart from him not providing a detailed strategy of how this free education would be paid for, he did it at a time where there was political turmoil and where there was no political will for us to be able to implement free quality decolonized education. And that has come back to haunt fees must fall. And more than anything, I think that announcement came as a means of pacifying students and getting them back into classes and appearing as though he is intentionally dealing with all the other issues that fees must fall brought to the forefront, right? So fees must fall is a kind of microcosm of society that we live in today. It gives you an idea of the kind of struggles that not only black people face in this country, but the barriers to basic services like water, electricity, and accommodation, right, and shelter. We have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, social movements, when, when you look at the research, show that they have insights of over the past 40 years, right? and they don't come um, out of nowhere. So it showed us that it involves both mobilizing people and organizing people, which are two distinct processes. And those distinct processes were something that our government was trying to interrupt and disrupt in order for them to continue perpetuating this neoliberal program that we are a part of today. Okay, we'll talk about that, about uh, infiltrating the movements and actually disrupting them, because very often that's what we see, the proximity to political power by the very same activist who initiate a particular disruption. But Mpo, let me bring you in here. I mean, you thought you could bring about change in Mangawung, in the ANC, EFF, Patriotic Alliance. It didn't happen. Why have you opted out of these uh, political parties? Political parties are a product of the system of government, which is the capitalist system in our case in South Africa. And uh, political parties as the administrators of the system in itself and the interest of the ruling class become an instrument that suffocate and demobilize communities. 
that in, intends to ensure that control, the voice and the intentions the communities would have to relate with the system generally. And that even excludes almost the entire population of society. So some of us, including myself, we are a product of the organic struggle of our people. So are you suggesting we need to be on the streets rather than the ballot box, rather than the political layer of society? There are various forms of interrelating with the, the system. And ballot box is one of them. Being on the street is one of them. Negotiations and engagement is one of them. There are a couple of forms of engagement that you can actually force or maybe let the system to relate with you in the manner in which as a society you would love them to relate with you. So basically, uh, at this present moment, the system has actually forced us to change the form of relations and tactic of actually engaging with it. And being right. on the street is the same product of how the system relates with society generally. All right. Speaking of tactics, Mark, I know that you've been involved in a lot of historic cases that have been successful at the Constitutional Court and various layers of our judiciary. But I'll just pick one which I know is very, very close to your heart. Michael Komape, a five-year-old drowned in a pit latrine. I know that when you had Section 27 to force the government to compensate the family, they didn't get awarded the amount that was originally put forward. But at a broader level, the courts forced the government to commit to eradicating pit latrines. The MEC in that province actually came out and said they'll be eradicated by 2019. We are in 2021. We know that the Eastern Cape and other provinces still see pit latrines. Poor people can't afford to litigate indefinitely. So in a way, is it an exercise in futility? I don't think it's an exercise in futility. In the case of Michael Kamapi, there was an important justice won for uh, James and Rosina and the family and the recognition of the injustice and the wrong that was done. And there was important publicity and awareness given to the crisis facing children in schools in Limpopo and all over the country. Michael became and still is a household name. So it wasn't an exercise in futility, but using the courts is not enough by itself. So as we sit here today, you know, the government is saying they don't have enough money to eradicate dangerous pit toilets in Limpopo. I mean, it's a scandal that children are forced into these horrible, dangerous spaces as part of their, their schooling. And this is where I agree with with Mpo and, and Busi, is that litigation is one arm of exerting our rights. It has to be backed up by protest and mobilization. So let me give you another example. You know, we went to the courts over people's rights of access to antiretroviral treatment, and we won a very important case there in the constitutional court. But it was only because the treatment action campaign existed on the ground and in communities that in the years after the court case, we were able to keep the pressure up to force the delivery of antiretroviral medicines to clinics and to, to people. Now, we wouldn't have got five and a half million people on antiretroviral treatment today if it wasn't for the constitutional court case. But we wouldn't have five and a half million people on treatment today if it wasn't for the protest and the mobilization as well. And Akolile, you know all about mobilizing and being on the ground in communities in the way that uh, Mark has just described in Mpo as well. You are with Social Justice Coalition in Kailicha, in Cape Town, and I know right now with Right to Know, you continue in this life of activism. Do you feel that activism and protest has been powerful in transforming our society? And in relation to the government, do they take it seriously? The government tries to force people into engaging in certain ways, um, in ways that they, they view uh, are conducive for them. And these are spaces that some of us call um, the, the invited spaces. Hence, I think the discussion that has been had here is important in trying to bring together all the strategies that we can use. And so we need to invent uh, our own ways of engaging, even protest sometimes, because those that are in government now have protested before. 
And so they know how to deal with protest in, 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 in certain ways. And so we need to be creative in how we protest and where we protest, but we know that repression exists. And, and we need to continue to challenge the fact that uh, those who protest are continually repressed um, are using the, the, the police who are supposed to, to be there to protect um, and assist protesters in protesting. There are the many ways that the state uh, uses uh, to try and, and repress people. And so I think it's up to us to use all these texts. There's not one way where we can use and achieve many of the things that we'd like to, to achieve that the government hasn't delivered on. All right, let's hear from our audience now. Is there anybody who wants to share their views about the value of protest versus voting? Ruben. It's very imperative to know um, when we go vote, why we vote. It's been very crucial, especially to, um, after apartheid, um, we've been given a democracy, we've been given a, a platform whereby we can make our voices heard to the government. Whatsoever, I don't think that uh, it stops there. I agree that both it, it has a very crucial point, whether to, to make our voices heard to protest, because we have, in the past, we have won a lot of cases um, whereby we have shown the government that, well, that no, man, enough is enough. Thank you very much, Ruben. Back to our audience. Anybody else have something to say about this topic? Voting or out in the streets or both of them? Let's go to Mondli. Is it Mondli Manara? I personally think when it comes to activism, we should be involved. If one is able to be at the office, you need to be an activist there in the office by joining a union, becoming a shop steward. At the school, public school that you're sending your child, you need to form part of that school governing body and uh, in influence decisions if you can get in. And also within the community that you reside in, participate because there's so many things that are, are happening in our communities from the question of safety, uh, infrastructure, along with education. And they need all of us, those of us who can join in the, the board of the, the clinics within our communities, let's participate therein. So basically, we have to do both currently. We cannot separate the two. Okay, we got your message. Thank you so much, Monli. Really appreciate that. In one city in South Africa, protesters shut down the government and brought down the city manager. When we return, we talk to the protest leaders. This is The Big Debate. Welcome back to The Big Debate on social change beyond the ballot box. Bloemfontein is South Africa's judicial capital and one of our largest cities. And yet thousands of its residents live without running water, grid electricity or reliable refuse collections. In over two decades, the residents of Pitaswar's informal settlement <laughs> have been sharing a single communal tap, one tap, between 50 households. Amidst spiraling corruption and collapsed service delivery, residents have had enough. On Sunday, May 16th, Mangawung residents took to the streets to shut down the metro. Watch this. During apartheid, the Black Liberation Movement took to the streets and made the country ungovernable in a fight for basic human rights. The first democratic elections in 1994 were meant to herald a new moment in South Africa, where we had a government for the people, by the people. <laughs> But 27 years later, communities like the ones in Mangawung are still protesting for the better life that was promised. There's chaos this morning in Mangawung. The streets were brought to a standstill. As service delivery protests there continue. We realize that taking our demands to the street and making uh, things to happen also becomes an effective tool. Not that is the way to go, but we find ourselves being forced to force government to respond and to relate to our issues. That's the language everybody understand that. As the November 1 election draws closer, politicians continue to promise they will bring change. We're going to do better, we're going to improve. If we want to center around building a better future, we want to get things done in the community. But the question then becomes, is voting still the most effective way to improve people's lives? We must vote. But uh, if community in Nekapua, the opportunity that will be the best. Your vote, it's your voice, and will make sure that if they don't listen to you, we come back to the street and close these offices. 
While some still believe in voting, others have placed their faith in community action to create the South Africa they want to live in. This whole place now you can show where you stand now today. It was a dumping place. Now we're going to took this dumping place and we turn it out in community gardens because why? We saw the need in Aydadal, in our community. There's no food. Now what must we do? That's why we changed the whole place. We put up community gardens so that we can feed our people. Na my personal view, go regarding one, it's November, we better shut down. We start by letting people down. We fit hell, we fit hell. The government are going to be understand. Go re. Haba jula mo gabo na ba jusi karo na mo nuno. But let me le ba service karo na ba tolo service di bokoto zabo. Hmm. Paul, let me start with you there. Was this a protest by poor communities, or did it draw some of the wealthier residents in the suburbs of Bloemfontein? Tell me about that. Look, every society uh, has a particular uh, system of government, and ours is a capitalist society where uh, we have classes, uh, the poor and the rich, and the middle class in, 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 in between those two. Okay, I think we've lost Mpo. We'll come back to Mpo in a moment. But Mark, I mean, we saw with the Zuma Must Fall, Save SA, you found suburban residents joining their township counterparts in this political message. But generally, our protests seem to be isolated, each community for itself, that as the larger South African community, we don't really care and we are not stirred when people have to wake up to the stench of sewage running down their streets pit latrine toilets. How do we create a multiracial, multi-class, multi-generational culture of protest in South Africa? Because we've had it before with the fight against apartheid. It's the poor, really, who are being failed by our government. And at every level of government, national, provincial, local, it's the poor, as Mpo said, who are having resources stolen from them. Uh, leaving people hungry, leaving people without sanitation. But I think that solidarity across classes is becoming increasingly important. And I think it's very important for people who have privilege, who live in comfortable homes, to show that they are concerned about the crisis that faces tens of millions of people in our country. And it can be done. You know, we've seen in this period of COVID the emergence in some of the big metros of these things called community action networks, where community action networks are working across class divides, across race divides, to try to ensure food security, to try to ensure early childhood development, basic education for, for, for young people. So I, I think that, that there has to be an appeal to the more privileged people in this country to recognize that we are all together, we are all under one constitution, to turn out on protest, to, to, to lend their voice to legitimate demands of poor people for constitutional rights that are taken for granted by rich people. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a country with deeper and deeper and deeper polarization. It's difficult to build that solidarity, but I do think that we have to try. We see, let's talk about fees must fall. What I remember is that there was generally a lot of solidarity and a lot of sympathy until there was destruction to public infrastructure, university infrastructure, then security was brought in. I mean, even that Mangaung shutdown that we just saw on our screens was not perfect. A 15-year-old boy was shot and killed by a security guard and there were some xenophobic uprisings. So it seems as if an initiative begins and this is how it ends up. And then it it loses the sympathy of the general public. Is that what happened with Fees Must Fall? Where do you place or locate the violence in all of that? One thing that is important to me, and I think to my fellow activists as well, is to be able to clearly define and distinguish violence and militancy. Fees Must Fall was not a violent movement, but it was a militant movement. And militancy is a response to violence, right? So the violence that we had experienced, not only as students, but Black people from the state, from institutions of higher learning, from private security, um, we responded to that violence with militancy. And when society or the public or our parents saw us, our response to violence 
um, being militancy, they then stepped back to a large extent. So the only way to a large extent that Fismas 4 was able to achieve a lot of the things that it was able to achieve, like the insourcing of workers, was using militancy. It is an important and very viable tool to use in political and social movements. We can't ignore the importance of visuals, right? With fire, for an example, if you see a tire burning in the street, that visual on its own invokes a certain emotion to be able to try and investigate what is particularly happening. It brings an, a feeling of urgency to a matter and it allows people to be able to unburden themselves, right? Because to a large extent as black people, as people in South Africa who have a very, very um, checkered past, we are holding in a lot of what we would like to communicate, not only amongst ourselves and with each other, but with the state as well. And when you speak about the constitution, I mean, the constitution is the last document we should ever look at to be able to define or to, to structure how South Africans as citizens should engage with one another. So voting becomes a, an important means of determining the kind of South Africa we would like to have. But we must also understand the fact that we have chosen democracy, we have chosen capitalism. And from the choice alone, we will not be able to bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Okay, let me bring you in here, because we lost you. We're talking about uh, the Mangawung shutdown and the fact that a 15-year-old uh, young man was shot and killed by uh, security. I mean, is there a dark side to protest movement? And I also want to get your thoughts to one of your comrades there who said that we should actually even have a shutdown of the voting process itself. Nobody should be allowed to vote. Is there a dark side to protest action? Very quickly, please, Mpo. Democracy as a system of government serves the interest at this present moment of the ruling class and uh, the poor don't benefit anything. In fact, they, they live through deception uh, by the, those who, who govern this country. But it needs to be taken into account that in confronting a system that has the state power, in this case, your tactics will be informed by the prevailing situation in order for you to be able to reach your strategic objective. So ours was to actually ensure that we can uh, air our view and ensure that we get responded to by the government. But we have a local government here that is actually uh, controlled and owned by thugs, by looters, by corrupt individuals. And in order for us to can be able to uproot that and ensure that we get that to an end, we are actually being forced to go to the street. It was never our intention, and I don't think it's anybody's intention to find that we experience a loss of lives or uh, people get injured or jailed. But the system responds to our action as society in that particular manner to actually be able to suppress us. Thank you, Mpo. Akoli, let's bring you in here. I mean, you've been involved in so many protest actions in the Cape, in the Cape uh, area. How do we build effective and sustainable social movements that stand the test of time, firstly, but also that are insulated from the violence and sometimes xenophobic uprisings or uh, even uh, uh, dividing the activists themselves. We saw with Fees Must Fall how the movement was infiltrated by politicians as well, thereby weakening it. So how do we build effective social movements? Um, it's not an easy thing, especially... Um, in societies, I mean, if you look at how, how, how Cape Town is set up, how divided it is um, in terms of race, in terms of class, um, it's, it's, it's never easy to try and bring different people together. Specifically, if you're bringing poor and working class people together, because that in itself needs money. Um, and these are people that do not have money. There's barriers in terms of language, in terms of how we communicate, uh, because not everyone can speak English. And there's 11 official languages in South Africa. It's difficult to organize. But these are things that we need um, those who do have money to try and contribute and invest in. We need to set up political education schools. We need to train activists to try and be able to defend themselves. We shouldn't be doing that, but that's that's the status quo. We know that um, the, 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 the repression exists within our movement, the infiltration exists, and we need to find ways to, 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 de to defend ourselves. I think it's, it's important to, to also touch on this issue of language, just in terms of how we speak. 
uh, of what we view as violent and what is not violent. Poverty is violent, racism is violent, but we don't talk enough about those things. We only talk about violence of burning a building. When miners in Marikana were killed, that was the most extreme violence, and those lives were never going to get back. But when a building is being burnt down, we see uprising, even though you can build a building again. What we start to see with protests is that government themselves encourage these, these, these so-called violent protests, because those are the protests they respond to. They don't respond to peaceful protests. They want to see a tire burning. They want to see a building burning. And so it's them themselves that are encouraging that. And so it's it's not going to end if government doesn't come to the table and engage people in, in, in spaces where people are not seen to be, to, to be violent. All right, Akhalile, I believe that we do have such a political school. You talked about political education. Shisimani, I understand that you are engaged in an effective way of educating South Africans to be active, to understand the political landscape, and to really demonstrate the kind of political education that Akrolile is talking about. Is there anyone there who wants to make a quick comment? I've been involved um, in organizing a range of workshops and activities um, with activists in Cape Town, some of whom are in the room today. Um, so on the, on, on the local government elections, um, we've engaged in a number of workshops and out of these workshops, it's quite clear that activists are exploring a range of issues um, and a range of pathways to resolve the local government system. So voting is, is one of them, and certainly there are many activists who are committed to that. But quite a few activists also feel that, you know, maybe it's time that we also take over aspects um, of local government functions ourselves to try and fix the roads ourselves and to try and build alternatives outside of the local state. And then there are activists who also believe and take inspiration from those that have, have pursued the courts. Um, so, for instance, activists in Makanda, activists elsewhere who have gone to the courts and said the courts must dissolve um, councils that are no longer serving them, um, as, as, as one example. But um, I, I do have a few um, other comrades who want to say a word or two about the question on the table today. All right. We'd love to hear from more of you. Go ahead, please. We are being called uh, criminals, being called uh, violent people when we attend to things uh, on the streets. So for us taking our struggle to the streets, we must not be insulted the way we are. People are not happy with the current government. For instance, the voting system to get us to vote for ANC because people are, are afraid for DA to lead because of it's a, it's a white-led organization. And people are afraid to vote for EFF because EFF is a also an organization that presents to self as, that can cause uh, sanctions to the country. As activists, we rather say that let's collapse the system of voting, because the system of voting is a manipulative system or, or, or on its own. We rather go to the street and challenge uh, the municipality through courts. The, the violence is not only, uh, only going for the streets, but also the racism that we are having here, particularly in, in the Cape Town, but in Cape Town, we are white-led, and there are bylaws that have been implemented to ensure that black people don't go any closer to the city. And we cannot speak about democracy when there's such things that happen in the country. Let, let's give someone else a chance. We'll get one more view from Chisimani. Is there anybody else who wants to speak? One last one. What happens after voting? It's, it's a very important question because activism does not only end on the question of voting or electing a particular person which we are interested in. But it also goes on beyond even to account, to make that person account. The voter education is important because our people believe that the ANC as the liberation movement needs to hold on to power till Jesus Christ come back. I mean, there the are people that are saying that in our communities. It's a governing party now. It's no longer a, a, a liberation movement. Therefore, it needs to account to its own citizens. Thank you so very much. It's ANC politicians, actually, that said they would rule until Jesus comes. It's very interesting to hear that there are members of community who also say that. But those of you who read the Bible, you remember there's a scripture in Revelations where Jesus says, I cometh soon. When we return, we question whether our voting system can ever work for the poor majority. If not, what needs to change? And how do we force that change? Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching The Big Debate. In South Africa, we vote for parties. And then when we don't like our leaders, it's almost impossible to remove them because we are up against those 
big parties. Again, if we are to hold our leaders to account, it seems clear we need to be able to fire them quickly and easily, either by voting them out or some other form of pressure. Let's talk now about our power as citizens. Mark, I'm going to start with you. Last year in June, the Constitutional Court ruled that uh, independent candidates can contest provincial and national elections. It was a historic moment. Many people were excited and welcomed it because it seems that it would finally extricate us from the power and the hold of political parties. Are we moving closer through this constitutional court ruling to be empowered to fire MECs, councillors, MPs, and so on? Ridi, I think we are if we, the people, take advantage of that ruling to organize ourselves better on the ground, if we take advantage of it to put up independent uh, candidates, uh, maybe too late, although there are some in this coming local government elections. My feeling is with the existing political parties is that they're all bankrupt. They've all been captured. They've all been corrupted to one extent or another. So they're going to get back into power in these local government elections. I don't think that means that we could just surrender. One thing that the Constitution does do is give us a lot of power to hold them accountable. So we must hold them accountable. We must say what they should be doing at local government level. We must make our demands very, very clear. We must monitor the expenditure at local government level. I mean, it's unbelievable. Here where I am sitting in Joburg, you know, hundreds of millions of rands wasted by Johannesburg Metro Council during the COVID-19 crisis. But there are people sleeping on the streets. There are people hungry. You know, there's money, but it's going to the wrong places. So, you know, a number of people have said democracy has, has failed us. I'm not sure if democracy has failed us. I think we've failed democracy because we've failed to hold many of these people to account and to make them act in the people's interest. I think the worst thing to do would be to not vote. You know, I don't know who I'm going to vote for at this moment in time, but I'm going to go and vote even if I go and I spoil my vote because I think it's important as an active citizen that I show I vote. But the day after I've voted, I'm not going to sit back and do nothing for the next five years. I'm going to continue fighting building power at community level to make sure that there's accountability and delivery in the interests of poor people. We see just very, very quickly, I mean, the act of voting itself, petitions, we've seen petitions as well, total shutdown, we've seen hashtags, we've actually seen political parties lose favour. The DA right now with its posters and some racist interviews where they erase the voice of a black woman. We've seen political parties try to come to social media with ANC Friday or EFF this, and the public just comes out using those tools on social media to say, you know what, we cut fall with you, footsec, this campaign is not going to work. So even that, at that level, there is some effective protesting and people amplifying their voice. In your mind, what does it take then to build an enduring democracy where citizens are more powerful than politicians? We are probably the best informed and equipped to vote in South Africa's history. Right? So social media and the internet is giving us access to information which previous generations of voters didn't have. We are becoming the experts ahead of our parents and grandparents, and we need to be able to use these expertise to make sure that our country heads in the right direction. But I think one thing that is very important is that voting gives you the opportunity to be part of decision-making. If you don't vote, others will make the decision for you. I mean, I'm appalled by people saying, I'm going to go and spoil my vote. I don't know who to vote for. If you don't know who to vote for, then run for local government. Because I think it's important that we understand that it is at local government level where we may measure in material terms the success and failures of governance, right? Never mind the revolutionaries, never mind the gradualists or the free marketers. Now is the time to ask, what have you done for me lately? And can I trust you to do better next time? The ANC has repeatedly shown us and proven to us that they can't do better, that they don't have a proper plan or vision for this country. But someone else must, right? The kind of constitution that we have, with its limitations as well, does not afford us 
the concept of justice, right? Um, and although we may be able to take political parties and everyone else who's a part of governance to courts, there's also limitations with what the courts can do. There's also limitations to what the, the constitution is able to do. We need as citizens to take charge of the kind of country and development that we want to see. Of course, Ramaphosa central government is responsible for the disbursement of funds, but it is up to locally elected officials to gain access to those funds and spend them wisely. I must say at local government, there are independent candidates. We spoke to them here on the big debate and the issues are very different. But at national level, I do have sympathy for people who say, I don't know who to vote for. You find a party that claims to be efficient in service delivery, but being so tone deaf about the race relations in this country. You find somebody who's talking talking about clean and efficient government being so absolutely xenophobic. So at that national level, there is a bit of challenge. At least I'm experiencing it, and I'm an active citizen who doesn't want to run for elections. But at local government election, clearly the issues are really different, and they are about your communities and your local representative representing you and arguing your case. So on November 1st, South Africans go to the polls to elect local representatives. Will you be voting? protesting, shouting from the rooftops, or checking out. Tell us in a moment. Welcome back to the big debate on democratic participation in South Africa. Can we be the change we seek? If so, will we exercise our power in the voting booths or in the streets? or by rebuilding our communities, ourselves, or all of the above? Let's hear your views. I want to hear from our audience members. Nom Vuselelo. I'm going to be doing both. I'm going to be on the streets and I'm going to uh, again, practice my right to vote. My thing is, it's not that easy to say you're going to hit the streets because people die on the streets. For example, the protest in the beginning of the year, the one for every student must register. A man died in Bramfontein, a man that was not even part of the protest. And that's very traumatizing because we had students that watched that person take their last breath. So we, it's also a question of, if I don't vote, this government is going to keep ruling and it's going to keep exercising its very brutal tactics to want to kill down activism, which has been seen in the past years. So I'm going to vote them out and I'm still going to go to the streets to hold the people that I voted in accountable. I think what's important is that we uh, focus on what the activists and the communities are doing to respond to the crisis in local government. There's four options that have been popular. The, the big one, of course, is protest. South African can be easily defined as, you know, the country of service delivered protest. The, that's the domination. That's what we do. And we've seen how some, sometimes it has worked, sometimes it hasn't worked. The second option now that's growing has been uh, vote them out. Vote out corrupt politicians. Vote out useless parties. They are not serving our, our municipalities. And uh, for this year, uh, you know, we have the highest number of independent candidates, uh, numbers that we have never seen before in this country. So the people are saying, no, vote them out, choose local leaders, that's an option. And uh, the third option that has come up from activists and communities and what we have seen is uh, uh, take them to court. And we've seen uh, municipalities being uh, dissolved because of court uh, uh, interdicts and court decisions. Uh, the Makanda situation comes to mind. All right, uh, Zama, I think you froze there. We lost you, but points well made. Stephen. Stephen Tapelokuno from Abashali Baset Dihet. This uh, institution was formed as a result of Blayton Zimande unlawfully cutting salaries of CT lecturers with more than 150 million. So what are we saying here? We are saying people must vote and also people must also know that they have more than 1,800 days of activism now, because we must not only vote for people, but we must support them. But where they are bored and they are trying to, they are corrupt, like Director General Tonde, they steal the money, we must move them out. So that's what needs to happen, and that's what we call active democratic uh, centralization. If you go and vote, uh, don't call that a lot. All those votes uh, are needed. Voters who know that they do not need to keep the same party in government if the party doesn't deliver. Uh, but that will only happen with uh, the voter education that has been uh, alluded to. But with that voter education comes the issue of uh, what type of leadership we need to have. Uh, because there is a need of a fundamental change in leadership. We need transformational, innovative, and what I often call uh, second generation leadership. 
uh, to which uh, accountability should come naturally without being demanded by the citizens. Let's continue to be active in our own corners in holding uh, those in power to account. Uh, in time, we will get to where we want to be as a country. Thanks a lot. I believe voting is the only tool that exists in a democracy. The reason why I'm saying this, uh, protesting, burning tires does not help. If we have problems with the, 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 the people on the top there, we have to vote them out. Get new new people who will help us. This thing of protesting, burning tires, people end up uh, burning clinics that we need. So we must vote as the yeah. only tool that we can use. I believe so. I think it's better for us to vote for another organization, the one that we can we see that is working because we can no longer vote for EANCs being 27 years. And uh, when we vote for the ruling party, we are still destroying our nation. We are still destroying our communities because they are not doing it for us. They are doing it for themselves. They are capturing everything that they see. They, they are even capturing houses. They don't care about anybody else. Like where I am from, we tried to tell them that we don't need this counselor, but they still select that person because they know that he is a monster. That is why my view is that when we vote, we have to vote for a different party. We cannot longer vote for ANC. Thank you very much for airing your views, all of you. And I think also your experiences, because that's very important. Here on The Big Debate, we want to honor and respect the experiences that you have so generously shared with us. So we've heard from our audience. When we return, we hear the final words from our panel. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Big Debate. We've been discussing what an active citizenry looks like in South Africa. Let's hear final thoughts from our panel. Enimpo, I'm going to start with you. Your thoughts about this particular situation, voting and protest in South Africa. Let's go and vote and ensure that we put uh, people we can trust with our development going forward. But also we need also to ensure that we unite as citizens of this country and in particular people of Mangaung who have been divided by the rule of East Mahashule for a very quite long time in this particular uh, municipality. People from Tabelo, Tabanjo, Fanstad and everywhere else, Bloemfontein, it's time for all of us to start to unite and ensure that the remnants and the leaders of East Mahashule and the rest of others, other people are actually getting destroyed. We must also call back for the establishment and then the reinstatement of uh, Bloemfontein Celtics, the leaders and the history of Mangaun, the Free State in general. We must ensure that uh, the people, all of them who have been uh, destroying our municipality, all get ac uh, to account for what they have done. Dr. Lile, very briefly, please. I think, uh, one, I want to, 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 to seriously call out the IEC on the tweet. Um, that they tweeted that if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. If the ANC thinks that they can rule until Jesus comes, we have a right to complain until Jesus comes. So that tweet was very problematic, and I hope the IEC is going to uh, retract retract that. Secondly, I think we, we have not necessarily as a country paid enough attention to local government and local governments, and we need to start doing that. We need to start paying enough attention to issues such as local government budgets and budgeting within local government. It cannot be that in a municipality such as the city of Cape Town, with a budget of over 50 billion rands a year, that budget is decided by a few white men uh, who rule um, the, the, the city as part of the DA. And that 80% of the population, which is black, is left out of that process. Places that are being prioritized are the places that we know are the affluent and predominantly rich and white areas. We need to participate in the budget process. We need to make sure that that process is made easy and that it's, made, it's explained in each and every language so that everyone can decide where that 50 billion rand uh, is spent so that we can be able to monitor it and complain because we have that right to complain. Absolutely. Mark, final thoughts from you. As Stephen said, let's vote and then let's follow it up with 1,800 days of activism. And on each of those days, let's make sure that at local government, we address issues of homelessness, food security, early childhood development for young children, particularly for poor black children who are not getting access to early childhood development. 
we address issues of safety and security. Let's just make sure that we take control of these counselors and make them work for poor people and in everybody's interests. Busi, final thoughts from you very briefly, please. The country we know is a constitutional democratic dog, South Africa, that allowed the NP to secure lasting concessions, which are likely to continue in the future as they have dogged us in the present. So history shows us that democracy is in danger of losing their freedom, where just a frighteningly low voter turnouts. Right? In thriving democracies, people vote in large numbers and the people's voice remains supreme. On the 1st of November, 2021, I would ask that we all vote out corrupt politicians, vote out the corrupt ANC government and the racist DA. South Africans need to vote for jobs and land, manje, to be able to address a lot of the issues um, that you know my previous speaker had already mentioned around food security and poverty, and to engage in political education in order to hold um, you know, our elected councillors accountable, particularly to the youth. Our time is now. We are the beautiful ones, the ones who are going and are present changing the course and trajectory of our development as a country. And we need to take up that mantle without any prejudice and with conviction, because this is our generational obligation. Saving South Africa, um, getting land and jobs manje is our generational obligation as the youth, and we need to take it seriously. Mm, sounds very much like someone's manifesto, but absolutely uh, hear your passion and your commitment, particularly to voting and urging citizens not to disengage from the process. Thank you so very much. OK, folks, the right to vote is something that every South African has to take seriously after so many lives were lost to ensure that we all enjoy that right. Protest and civil disobedience are also etched in the DNA of our democracy. Will we ever see a protest-free South Africa, or will we always need citizen action to light that fire under our politicians to build a better life for all of us? You decide. Remember, the local government elections are on the 1st of November. I'm Ridi Kabi, and you've been watching The Big Debate.